My name is Carl Buttress from, um, from uh, Griffith University. This is my second time at uh, DevWorld as a presenter. Uh, I must have done okay last time because they've called me back again, so I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, unlike uh, Tim's presentation, mine's on uh, custom maps using core location as opposed to using MapKit. Uh, this probably I'll go through the process of why we chose custom maps over MapKit uh, for our upcoming application that we're releasing hopefully in the next month or so. Uh, and it's, yeah, I, we'll just go through the whole thing. <laughs> it's easier that way. Uh, so as Tim alluded to, MapKit does 90% of pretty, of everything most people will want to do. So it gives you nice, nice maps, locations, directions, the whole, the whole whiz bang, all for not much coding and a lot of effect for the, for the end user. Uh, the problem is for us that there were limitations on uh, how much we can zoom in and get the building locations for our university and the licensing, the, the uni didn't really like the licensing that um, using Google or some other third parties w was going to affect with the university on a commercial basis. So a couple of little things that made us um, warrant looking at other options. So there's, uh, there's nice things about MapKit but like I said, for us, it was just too limiting in some areas. So our initial thoughts, and this is the launch screen of our app that's coming out pretty soon. Uh, we're, we're a fairly large organisation like most universities are. There's 35, over 35,000 students, 4,000 staff. Uh, we're in five different uh, physical locations, so five campuses. Uh, each campus has multiple buildings. It's all privately owned, obviously. And Google doesn't drive through and take pictures of everything. So we couldn't actually use MapKit to get to the granularity that we wanted to. On investigation, we uh, found that across the university, mobile device use for accessing the network was growing rapidly. And when we started the, this project, there was probably 20% use for iPhone, iPod Touch accessing the network as a mobile device. And since the iPad has been re released, uh, that's increased yeah, a large number as well. I don't have the actual numbers, but it's increased significantly since then. So we wanted a, a way for students and staff, uh, especially if they're new to the, camp, uh, to the university, to either find their way around, find rooms, locations, buildings, staff members, or whatever. And as you can see, uh, some of the main things we have, they've got the maps. Okay, which is specifically for maps that uses our, our mapping system, uh, the address book, uh, timetable. So if you're going to a new room or a new lecture theatre, it's going to access the map, and computer labs as well. So it uh, shows you the availabilities of what labs are there and what computers are free, and it'll show you direction how to get there. If you're a new student in your first year, that's going to be uh, a big assistance. Uh, I guess our initial thoughts with this, we were hoping to use Google Maps because it's obviously easier. Everything was there ready for us. And it was talking about using hybrid applications for and just plugging in a web view basically and using uh, the internal searching that Griffith has to find the locations of buildings and whatnot. But we found that uh, it just wasn't going to give us the functionality or the actual views that we wanted to, to give the student or the staff member uh, for good use. And you'll see those uh, when I show the maps in a minute. Uh, so we thought about using third-party frameworks, and there's a few out there. And at the time we started this project was probably about six months ago. Uh, the two main ones that we had a look at were CloudMap and OpenStreetMap. And though they're really good, they just didn't, again, give us the same granularity that we wanted to uh, as far as looking at building level and room level location stuff. And again, their, their licensing and commercial use policy was just not what the university thought was going to be acceptable for them. So again, that pushed us towards, well, we better build our own system. Okay, so there's MapKit, CloudMap, OpenStreetMap, all pushing us away from pre-built functionality. So we bit the bullet. And 
our, process, our thought processes, I guess, were, from a bare bones point of view, looking at specific maps for each campus. And as you can see, the, the red dots indicate the physical locations of the campuses within the southeast Queensland area. So they're not that close, except for Mount Gravatt and Nathan. Uh, there's probably 100 k's between one and the other. Uh, we wanted a where am I functionality, so I'm at this point, at any spot, on any map, on any campus. And we wanted to, to be able to give a location of a room, if necessary. Uh, in our first iteration, rooms won't be available, we're just going to the building. So once you get to the building, uh, you, you have to find your way in. Uh, we're doing some Wi-Fi mapping to get uh, room locations down to the room level as well as far as next iterations of the, of the application go. Uh, this is one of our custom maps. Sorry about the resolution on this. It's, this screen isn't as good as we'd like. Uh, this is uh, Gold Coast Campus. So as you can see, all the dark greys are individual buildings. Uh, Google and the other maps just go to the street level, so you're only seeing this, this type of detail. And with a over 150 buildings, we thought, how can we actually get location data for all these places? So we thought, well, we could uh, con a student into walking around to every location with the GPS and, and mapping the points. Uh, but they weren't really keen to do that. <laughs> I wasn't keen to do it either. So. We found, we found an easy way to do it using uh, some calculations with uh, GPS locations, latitude and longitude, which I'll go through in a little bit. And um, it, we came out to a fairly accurate system so we can get to within probably five metres of the building using this type of you know, calculations that we're doing. One of the main parts of this, and visually the, the map is the most important part of, of the view, there's three things that we had to consider. The overall physical map size. So was it going to be too big for to hold in cache to load over and over again for the, for the phone? And when we started, we wanted to use it on iPhone 3G all the way up to iPhone 4. So there's a, a great disparity against usable memory uh, for loading images. Uh, so the size of the map, the scale of the map, and the orientation of of the buildings on the map as well. So they're the three main things. And as you can see, there's these are, in relative terms, the size of the maps. So they're all different sizes. So each campus has pretty much a different size map. But they have uh, two things in common. Okay. Uh, the scale and the orientation. So the scale of uh, 0 to 100 metres is the same on every map. And we use that to uh, calculate the pixel number of pixels per 100 meters. And we use that as well as the, the GPS latitude and longitude to get 100 meters for GPS coordinates as well. And obviously the map orientation, not so necessary in this version, but when we start to use the uh, gyroscope and all this type of stuff later on, the orientation of the map becomes a little bit more important. <coughs> The type of maps that we used, and eventually we came down to using a JPEG. We did start off using uh, vector maps, um, PDFs, and all, all types of different maps. We found JPEG to be si significant enough or, or usable enough for us to give us good enough, I guess, um, quality of map when we zoom in uh, to give the user a good quality image. Uh, and luckily our facilities department has uh, vector maps of every campus down to, um, I think, centimetres. I've got no idea, but when we saw the mapping guys, that they've gone huge maps. I could have a, a map at about, uh, uh, I don't know, I think it was over 10 meg for just a building if they wanted to give us so much information. It was, it was unbelievable. And we're just about to hit our beta testing, so some of the information that's on these maps will probably change. Some of the colours may change. So we've tried to go for uh, neutral colours, so if you've got a little bit of colour blindness, I don't know how you can see that, Tristan, because you... We've tried to make the colours fairly relevant to and cover most people as well. So we, we tried to cover those things as far as thinking about it with concern. 
Uh, how we use the map in the app itself, it's uh, embedded, all the maps are embedded within uh, in the application and we use UI scroll view. We did think about tiling, but uh, for what we wanted, it was just overkill. And when we get to build an iPad version, we'll probably use larger images then and employ the tiling method as well. And just use uh, UI scroll view and tiling method just straight out of the box. And so we decided in the end that it's uh, probably easier just to use a JPEG single image and we can get into a zoom zoomable level that's readable and good for the user. Uh, we're using core location, obviously, because it's the easiest way to get location information using Wi-Fi, GPS, straight on your device without too much trouble. Uh, if you can see that, that's pretty much all you do. You have the, the core location framework and you start the updating location. You give it a, a, an accuracy, accuracy level in this case, we've gone best. That gets down to the meters. And we've found through testing, we probably get it within three to five meters of accuracy, which is pretty good when you're walking around a campus full of trees. And when we're updating, and we update constantly, so if somebody's moving from building A to building B, and their location is changing as we go through. Okay, so we're integrating with core location nice accuracy and updates automatically for us. So we can cut that down if we want to preserve battery life and all this type of jazz. But we found that people are using this maybe three to five minutes at a time. So you have the app on for three to five minutes, it's not going to drain your battery that much. Uh, if we find from testing that it's doing too much damage, well, we can change that in the code as well. So I guess this is probably the, the money slide. How do you get a GPS coordinate onto a, onto a flat map with any kind of accuracy? Mm. So we came up with a, a lot of trial, of trial and error, a lot of looking at different formulas on how to do this uh, across many websites. But in the end, it was down to a few magic numbers and this formula probably won't mean anything to you, but it's basically uh, coordinate Y, coordinate X with uh, a GPS X location by a, a pixel value, which is a, one of our magic numbers, which we've figured out through trial and error and some other fancy work with the math guy at uni. Come down to probably three magic numbers. So a distance location for the number of pixels across each map. Uh, a distance of how many pixels it takes for 100 meters, uh, how many pixels or how many GPS coordinate change levels in 100 meters, and we calculate all this to give us a fairly reasonable accuracy. So it's our, our magic numbers, and if you come to us a bit later, we can show you, I'll show you the code on that. It's not that exciting, which is why I've done crazy math. <laughs> uh, so most important was the scale. So how many pixels in 100 meters and how many, uh, how far a GPS location to 100 meters relates to that 100 pixels. Uh, on the map itself, and I think I go through that, yep. So there's our constants. We have uh, the, the 100 meter pixel constant uh, and the GPS 100 meter constant as well. On every map, we have a survey mark, which we know is a sp specific GPS location. So we, we know that on each map, at this point, we know exactly what, what and where we are. Then we can triangulate what and where we are to where we want to go using uh, some fairly simple maths. And it is simple maths. It's much clearer here. Okay, so it's it's all about um, knowing a certain location on a on a map, and using our our magic numbers to calculate the distances between each point. So it's not real rocket science, but it was more tricky 
to start with, nothing else. On each of the maps, we wanted to have data for building locations. And as I said before, nobody was willing to walk around to each campus and, and plot it. Uh, so we walked out to one or two places and got a GPS location and using our formulas from the previous slide, um, calculated how accurate we were and we were within three to five meters of every building that we wanted to, to be, which was kind of handy. Uh, the distances between our positions, so as you saw there we had, that's where we were, that's where we wanted to go, calculate the distance and using another fancy formula, square root of the distances plus our magic number, which is a divide, oh, basically it's, it's a one meter of a, a GPS location that gets us to within that distance. It's not that difficult when you look at it. It's probably harder to talk about than it is to actually do. Uh, so we took the easy way to get the distance and, and di direction. In our future implementations, we want to have a directional arrow showing you which way it is towards your desired location. And eventually we'd like a, a routing as well. But to get all these routing things, we'll need intermediary uh, GPS points. So this is a, a T-junction of between two buildings and all this kind of stuff. It's it's probably more legwork and calculating of where points are in relation to where we are on the map than anything else. Uh, so we've got a quick video demo of the application itself. This is the third iteration in the last probably four weeks of, of the user's view and navigation that so we're going through. I think I got a Nathan campus here uh, there's just a list of all the buildings we have on Nathan campus. So it scales down, down to the building, indicates that's where we want to go to. The map zooms and scales and slides around. It locates me where I was at the time in the building and calculates the distance between point X and point Y. At this point, it's in a straight line. So useful, but not completely useful, which is why we want the directional meter and a routing later on. So I've gone to a different campus. My nice same campus, just a different point. So it's 700 meters approximately from where I was sitting and to where I wanted to go. So, and that was fair, fairly accurate as we found. Yeah, so you can see there's lots of buildings there. If you want to walk around. And we, we were happy that our calculations kind of came to within five or 10 meters of every building. During the testing phase, we've still got the Latin long in the uh, in the map itself. Yes. Uh, hang on. I'll just as I said, this is internal testing only. So, and the information on the maps will change. So, this is pretty much. 80% of the information on the map. So yeah, things like that will come up in testing. And so if I think about it, it's probably on the, the, the campus maps as it is anyway. So. Um, yeah. so the maps can be located from maps, address book, timetable, and the labs facility as well. Uh, I'll just let it go through to a different campus. So it doesn't matter what campus you're on, you can find a location of a building on any campus from any campus. It just won't tell you how far it is because you're off campus. Is that happening on the key search for location? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's a, you can search by um, building name or building number or room name and room number as well. So you can see the map is quite readable when it's zoomed in. And it's just, a, I think most of the, the images are less than a meg in size. So that's quite good internally in the app itself. So you don't need to be online. You can just have the, the GPS going if, if you want. 
Um, it's only a flammable liquid store. It's not that important. <laughs> I think the next one goes to a different campus. So the most important thing for us with the images was the scaling. So making sure that 100 meters and 100 pixels was the same across everything. Because we knew a GPS lat and long was a, a constant figure. It does change depending on where you are, uh, north or south above the equator. But not significant enough for the two or three k's that we're talking about to make a big difference. Okay, so we're not on campus here. And that works uh, across all, all of them. So we couldn't get that level, the building level of, in, of information via MapKit or via CloudMap or OpenStreetMap, which is why we went this way. Um, and from giving it to the internal people, they found it quite useful because the number of people that walk up to the, the map and say, where am I and where to, how do I get to this building here? It's just a simple little thing. Yes, mate. Yes. How accurate, within how many metres can that get with, Depending on the, the GPS signal it's acquiring, okay. uh, yeah, within five metres. Oh, okay. quite, le quite easily within five to ten metres. Yeah. And if you've got a good strong signal, and iPhone 4 is even better, yep. yeah, it gets down to within a couple of metres quite easily. Yes. Yeah, we put that together. Uh, I think I've got a slide with a snippet of the data. Basically, it's an XML file. And uh, we've got, uh, we've just calculated um, pixel points within the map itself. And we know from calculations how to get a GPS location to that pixel point, which is the calculations we did. At the moment, it's just with us, uh, but yeah. Once we go live, we'll, we'll figure out more of those in-depth questions. <laughs> we probably should figure that out before we go, go live. So how we use it, and mostly it's a direct where, I, where am I map. So I'm standing in the middle of a campus somewhere. Where the heck am I? And I want to get to this building over here. Uh, building location, so you can search via name or building number. And it'll uh, zoom in, as you saw, to that building. Uh, lab locations, so there's lots and lots of labs across the five campuses. If you're a new student, how do you know where, where a lab is? It'll, the lab locations give you the number of free PCs or Macs within each lab and where it is and how to get there. And eventually we want to get directions, so if we're standing here, it doesn't want to go directly as the crow flies, we want to go around everything to get the entire system. So. The, the calculations are quite easy. I'll just jump out of this and bring up Xcode if I can. Yeah. It doesn't need to be online because the maps are embedded. Yeah. I started wrong Xcode. Number, there was only probably 150 entries. We could have gone SQL light, and probably when we go to the room level, because there'll be thousands of rooms. We'll you, you get your data from your engineers or whoever. Yep, so there's a couple of ways we're acquiring room data. Uh, wi Fi system has uh, GPS points for every Wi Fi station, and the number of Wi Fi stations are increasing across campus at the moment, and we'll be able to plot using those points where each room is. And that's at either if it's on floor one, two, three, or on ground floor, and where it is in the building. Uh, but we haven't quite got there yet. We've just stuck with building level at this stage, which is why we've gone XML. Uh, SQL light, probably 10, 10 lines extra code. So it's not a, it's not a big issue in, in that regard. Um, like Tim said, this is really hard to see when you're here. You can see all our messy code. Isn't that cool? Uh, is it? 
So zooming in, once uh, it gets a location, we're just zooming in by a scale of, of whatever we've, we've figured out that map needs to zoom in by. The, there's probably half a dozen magic numbers that we use across each of the maps in the GPS. So in our testing, we've got, so we can sit on one campus and be on any campus for testing. Uh, we've got some points automatically mapped in. So we've got this Latin long maps to this, pi this pixel on Mount Cravat. So that's basically what we've come down to. Um, where's my Trying to find the thing for calculation. So this is where the CL manager gets its uh, its like uh, acquires its location. Four lines of code, it's quite easy. It updates uh, as the user moves. So uh, zooming in. Don't you like our function name? It might just stay in location. Both updating location. There we go. So there's some of our magic numbers and the calculation of how to get a, a GPS point to a pixel point. A lot of trial and error, a lot of going to mrmath.com and finding out if if their GPS calculations were, were relevant or we just based it on pixels. And in the end, we just based it on, we know this point here is at pixel X, Y. How do we get this on every position? I guess we took the easiest way we could, but we found the, sometimes the easiest way is the most efficient we needed at that time. So unless you've got some questions, that's pretty much how it goes. Um, you mentioned part of the reason you didn't use the Google imagery was the license. Can you elaborate what specifically the problem with the license? I think it was the use policy. It, we, we looked at MapKit and thought, yeah, it was okay for us to actually use it to get locations and directions. It wasn't good enough to get the, uh, the physical buildings. And then we gave that to the, the management and the lawyers and they've read through the entire Google policy on commercialization and how many um, uh, page loads you can, all this kind of jazz you can get to it. And they didn't like the way that came out or like the way it read. So they felt that it was probably better to go our own way as opposed to use a third party. So I wish I could give you a specific, this is the clause in the licensing but the lawyers said, yeah, it took it out of my hands, which was good. <laughs> yes, Robert? Um, can you tell us a bit more about the process of Wi-Fi mapping on the campus to get more access to the campus? We're using Cisco. I think most of us are using Cisco um, routers across, across the, the system. And part of their software in the back end, uh, in the networking, allows you to give a GPS position for each Wi-Fi point. And from that, they They've got some calculations between the signal strength from this Wi-Fi point and the Wi-Fi point here, and they can extrapolate the distance between those and the rooms between. So again, it's it's mostly done by Cisco, and their software is uh, web-based. You can go into the Cisco router management and just give uh, GPS coordinates for each one and a name for it, and it gives you a GPS point for that location, I believe. I'd, Yeah, so call location, it won't be as accurate as GPS, so call location will go, uh, it'll use, I think, Wi-Fi first, then cell tower, if you've got a cell, and, and then GPS if you've got GPS. And it'll go to, if it finds a, a Wi-Fi that has the, the GPS locations associated with it, it'll use that to try and either hook into Skyhook to get the information of where that is. And, 
I think we have to feed that back to Skyhook or whatever Apple's using in, in the future because I'm not, I don't think they're using Skyhook anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep, yeah, we've looked at uh, hybrid apps, and probably the next iteration will be an Android operating uh, version as well, and possibly uh, Windows 7 if we can convince management to go down that route. The reason why we went with uh, iOS, first of all, was the number of devices on campus was significantly higher than all the others. So apart from that, it was like the big whiz bang cool thing at the time. Six to, tw six to eight months ago when we started this, it was like the hot thing. Uh, it still is, but Android is catching up. Windows 7, same again. I'm not sure if they're going to open it, but if uh, one university contacts our department, they'll probably be willing to share it, I'm sure. Yeah. Hmm. No other questions? As opposed to Tim, I'm nice and fast, nice and easy, <laughs> and don't bombard you with a thousand things. Uh, if uh, I can't actually, I've got it on my phone here, I can't actually show you too much of it working because we're not on campus. So it'll just show the map and show you the zooming, which is fine and you'll probably be able to see the, the relative quality of the image as it's zoomed in. If you want to see that, you're welcome to come up and have a chat as well. So, uh, thanks for turning up. Well done.